pone prezidentą pasakyti kalbą mūsų Seimo tribūnoje. Prašom, prezidentė. Gerbėjimą Saimo Pir Mininka, Garmėbį Saimo Nare, Labas Rytas. A very good morning to you. I don't think I have to say that in English because I think you've understood what I've tried to say. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, for that very kind uh, welcome and for the kind words. It is, of course, a very special honor for me as the president of an organization of which you are a proud member. Although we are celebrating the Silver Jubilee, which is 25 years of your membership of the IPU, your association with the IPU, in fact, goes back much further. In 1923, you first became a member of the IPU, and you continued that membership till uh, 1928. As I was uh, coming into the building, I was uh, taken around a photo exhibition. There are some exhibits, some documents from the past, which are on display at the main entrance. And I was amazed to see the importance with which this membership was recorded and publicized at that time. In fact, there is a newspaper there which goes back to 1924. And uh, IPU assembly that was taking place in Bern, Switzerland, was in fact headline news. It was on the first page. Now, I don't think my visit this time is going to be on the first page of any newspaper, but I think it just shows the value that uh, you have attached to the IPU, and it is thus a matter of great uh, joy that we are celebrating this silver uh, jubilee of your membership in the IPU. As Madam Speaker mentioned, the IPU, in fact, is a very unique organization. It is the only organization of national parliaments at a global level. Our membership today comprises no fewer than 170 national parliaments, who in turn have 46,000 MPs that represent 6.5 billion people across the world. So it is a unique organization. It's a unique organization for networking, for sharing best practices, for getting to know fellow parliamentarians from all over the world. And we have, in fact, prided ourselves on the diversity of our membership. So as I've said, this is 25 years. And if you go back to your own independence, which was in 1990, and then it was recognized at the UN in 1991, so your membership of the IPU has been there since your independence. So just as with the United Nations, the IPU has been a very important part of your international engagement and your international exposure. And I think Lithuania shows how a country which has been under severe centralized rule can make the transition into a democratic free society. And not just a transition, in the process, the people have benefited from this. So if you look at where you are today, you're a member of the European Union, you're a member of NATO, you're in the Council of Europe, you're one of the best places in Europe to do business, you have one of the fastest growing economies, and in terms of the Human Development Index, you are right up there. So you really are a shining example, and I think you as representatives of the people have every reason to take pride in this very spectacular progress. There are two other areas where we in the IPU salute you in particular. One is on the issue of women's empowerment, and I'm glad to see there are women members of parliament, and IPU has been working for empowerment of women, more participation of women in politics, and you, in fact, have a very rare attribute the leader of the people's representatives, the guardian of the parliament, the honorable speaker, is a lady. She's right behind me. And your president is also a lady. 
So when we talk about strong parliaments, we mean inclusive parliaments, parliaments that mirror the composition of society, and women are a very important part. Now, we don't want to refer to them as a women speaker, because I think they must have proved that they are just as effective, just as good, just as capable in running the affairs of the House as any men would be. The other area which has really struck a huge note within the IPU is the young parliamentarians and your representative to the forum of the young parliamentarians. I see uh, he is here, Mr. Gapsis is here, and he has been a great ambassador for you in the forum of young parliamentarians. Now these are two areas, women, young people that we in the IPU are really reaching out to, because I think this is where the future is. And if you look at the global agenda today, if you look at the great challenges that the world faces, these are all to do with 25, 50, 100 year time spans. When we look at the challenges we face, whether it is terrorism and extremism, migration into Europe, poverty, sustainable development, climate change, risk of disasters, these are all long-term problems, have long-term implications. So it's not a 100-meter sprint, it's going to be a marathon. And unless we embrace the young people, it's simply not going to work. When we met in, um, in, um, in Zambia earlier this year for our assembly, we released a report showing the number of young people in the world today and the number of young MPs in the world. And there is a huge disconnect between what is the reality out there in terms of demographics and what is the actual representation in the parliament. So these are, of course, two areas where you have really excelled. And I think you have so many achievements, so much progress to showcase, not just to this region, but also to the whole world. And I think the IPU is a perfect platform for doing that. We, of course, live in a world which is increasingly unpredictable uncertain, and even unsafe. There are major challenges that I've just referred to. And we as a parliamentarian and as parliaments have a duty to our constituents. What do we do? At the end of the day, we represent the people. So their well-being, their safety, their security is always in the uppermost of our minds. Our job is really to hold governments to account. We are not governments. So what is our role? So whether I am a parliamentarian from Bangladesh, my home country, or I'm talking to someone from Lithuania, we have four basic functions. One is, of course, making laws, legislative. One is approving the budget, appropriating resources, identifying the priorities that we have in the context of our own national challenges. The other is, of course, oversight. The money that we sanction through the budgetary process, to what extent is that money being well spent? That's oversight, that's our function. And the other, of course, is representation. Representing the interests of the people. So if you look at last year, and I briefly go to that, it was a huge year for the UN processes. This is when all of the UN processes came together. We had the risk reduction agreement in Sendai in March of last year, the disaster risk reduction. We had the sustainable development goals. And prior to that, we had the fourth World Conference of Speakers in New York, where your Madam Speaker had a very important contribution to make. So after the sustainable development goals, we had the climate change agreement in Paris. Now, all of these will have to be implemented. So to implement, you need resources. And more importantly, remember the agreements that have been signed at the UN tell us where we want to be in 15 years' time. But they don't tell us how we are going to get there. So the question of how is not answered in the agreement. It is for us as parliaments to debate what is going to be our national plan. How do we go from A to B? And that is for each country, for each parliament to determine as you go. So this becomes a very, very important role. So it's not just ratification of agreements. It is also implementing them. It is also to have our own national roadmaps that is going to take us to those places. 
So I think this is absolutely sacrosanct, and this is where we as parliaments can make a huge difference. And of course, the whole issue of sustainability, sustainability of the planet. You know, you have huge water resources. You are blessed with these natural resources. So how does Lithuania conserve its water resources and at the same time try and supply water to other countries in Europe, for instance? It's a huge challenge. And remember, if we continue on our current patterns of consumption and production, it's going to take not one, not two, almost three planet Earths to meet our requirement. So there is a huge sustainability issue. We simply can't sustain if we go on the basis of business as usual. We have to think of new solutions. Now, of course, how do we make our parliaments fit for purpose? How can we deliver on the goals that the global community is expecting us to deliver on? And the IPU is also working in this regard. I met with Madam Speaker earlier this morning, and we talked about how do we make parliaments fit for purpose. So just as there is a discussion on is the United Nations fit for purpose today, the other question is parliaments being fit for purpose. The other major area which I briefly want to touch upon is the area and the realm of parliamentary diplomacy. Now, the Cold War is long over, we know, but certain geopolitical shifts and actions over the past years are worryingly reminiscent of that East-West divide. We cannot say that we have achieved global peace. Far from it. And remember, peace isn't just the absence of hostilities. Peace isn't just the absence of war. I was introduced to the Honorable Defense Minister earlier, and I'm sure he will agree with me. Peace is creating the conditions that allows us to fulfill our potential as human beings and living with dignity, with rule of law. That is what peace is all about. And we are far from that. There are still many protected, simmering conflicts all over the world. So whether it is in the Middle East, whether it is in the Koreas, and even in your own region, these are areas where parliamentary diplomacy has a huge role to play. It may not be easy for governments and for ministers of governments to talk across the table. But we in the IPU have actually got together parliamentarians from Israel and Palestine to sit and talk. We are trying to get parliamentarians from North and South Korea to come and talk. And hopefully in the future, we will be able to get parliamentarians from this region to talk about some of the pressing issues and burning issues that you have. So whether it is the Middle East, whether it is the group of facilitators for Cyprus, uh, trying to look at the Turkish Greek Cypriot MPs and bringing them together, the IPU is really playing a very important role in parliamentary diplomacy. And I think this is essential to peace, which is, of course, one of the biggest uh, preoccupations of the United Nations. And let me finish by going back to the founding of the IPU, 1889, well before the United Nations, well before the League of Nations. In fact, it was the IPU that facilitated the coming together of the League of Nations. When Mikhail Gorbachev was uh, going to visit the United Kingdom and have his first meeting with Margaret Thatcher prior to Glasnost and Perestroika, it was the British group of the IPU which facilitated that meeting. In fact, the IPU was founded by two very distinguished gentlemen, one by the name of William Candle Kramer, an Englishman, and a Frenchman named Frederick Passy. And they envisioned a world where there would not be any need for wars, where through dialogue we could actually promote peace. And I think multilateral interventions, multilateral initiatives are more important, more relevant in the world today than they have ever been. So we as representatives of the people have a holy obligation. We have a duty of care to our constituents. We have to keep their interest paramount, because it's not just what we do today, it is how future generations are going to look at our actions. They will ask, did our parents, did our grandparents, 
do the right thing for the world. We have a unique opportunity to set that right. In fact, next month at the United Nations, there is going to be a discussion on the relationship between the United Nations, national parliaments, and the IPU. And this is going to be a very important discussion. And I just want to let you know that just as the IPU was with you in 1923, just as the IPU was with you in 1991, when you started this new journey, once again as an independent nation, we at the IPU are going to stand firm in our solidarity with the people of Lithuania and the parliament that we have here today. I wish you well. It's a great responsibility. But at least we, in our positions as parliaments and MPs, have the opportunity to make a difference in the lives of the people that we represent. That is the least that we can do. And on this very special occasion, celebrating the silver jubilee of your membership of the IPU, please, Madam Speaker, it's my pleasure to convey to you, to your parliamentarians and the people of Lithuania, a very happy silver anniversary, and we look forward to the next 25 years of continued cooperation and solidarity. I thank you for giving me this opportunity. It has been a real pleasure for me to address you, and I will end by trying something else in Lithuanian, and if it is uh, in error, please excuse me. Dekoi ush yusu de masi. Thank you very much. Dekoime te parlament ne asangos prezidentui sa berchaudri ush leikšminga pranesima.